like vinyl, you get to like skip through a record. Hey, CD, you pressing the shit, holding it down. What the fuck? That's some bullshit, you know? I will search for albums and I will continue to dig until I can't dig no more. When everybody else has stopped digging, I will still be digging. You know, because I will always be on the mission to find that one record. But I hear something, and I don't have it. I'll be like, wow. Okay, well, I'm gonna go home and make some shit, you know what I'm saying? That's what inspires me. And I hear something that's real dope, and it's a sample, and it's altered or whatever. It drives me to go home and get busy. I mean, they making CDs, but they can't put all this shit on no fucking CDs, you know? Records that sold like maybe 10 or 12 copies, they ain't gonna press no fucking CD for that, you know? So, you know, some people worry about CDs, but I really don't, you know? It's cool. You know, it's different stuff for different folks, you know? Sampling is the foundation of all hip-hop music, you know? That's where this started from for us, from DJs back in the park, catching a break, bringing break breath, you know what I'm saying? And keeping it going, you know, to somebody being able to sample and chop it up. That that, that will always be, you know, one of the elements of hip hop, man. Always. Deep thing. You know, because it's nothing like, like finding a fucking record. It's a, it's a rush, man. You know, you could be a guy with a fucking, without a dime in his fucking pocket. And uh, when you find that record, man, you feel like you got a million bucks. You feel like a million bucks. I'm addicted. I must say, I have an addiction, not a drug addiction. Here's a run for all the notes. A liquor addiction, cocaine, all that. No, oh, just man. records, records. I gotta buy records. Elements of hip hop, which controls a lot of other music now, from commercials to rock and roll to R and B, comes from samples. It comes from samples. That's where it starts at. That's where it's gonna end at. That's where it's always gonna be. If you're a real producer, if you're a real DJ, you can see the fucking break in, in vinyl. When you listen to records, and you can kind of look at a record and see a certain certain ridges, a, a certain design in a record that tell you, hey, let me skip to that part of the record. Once you DJ, you know what I'm saying, it's like you automatically become a producer. When you take, when you take a record and you're cutting it up, when, when you're blending it, that's your interpretation of that record. You produced that interpretation of that record. So, you know, that's our early steps. Then from DJing, you go into record collecting. You know what I'm saying? You go into um, buying beats, buying those rare records. You know, and then from that, you know what I'm saying, everything else comes. I mean, I had knowledge on records. And as far as doing beats, you know, it's like, you know what I mean, what's going with what? You know I mean, sort of like DJing, you mix and you got to find out what go with this, what go with that. And it's the same thing. You lay drums, what sound nice with that? You know I mean, what type of bass I would use with that? You know, so all came in play. DJing definitely advantage. You take two pieces of vinyl and cut them, to, you're cutting it up. All the sampler does is take those two, that, that, that section that you're cutting up and loops it. So it's the same principle. You sit there and construct a blend, you know what I'm saying? You say with a sample and construct the blend, construct the mix. It's, it, to me, it's like the same thing, except one you're using, one you're cutting up the records, the other one you're doing it by, you know what I'm saying, chopping sound. You know? It's the same principle to me. I actually got into beats because of the fact that me having old records and one of my uncles used to DJ back in the days. I used to just hear like a lot of old records and then I'd be like, wait a second, mango meat. Mandra, Jungle Brothers used that. That's all they did? Hold on, bird. Right. Let me go back. Let me look. Diodato. Here's, wait a second. I know that. Mark 45 King ran through a couple fat back. Oh. I was like, that's all it is? Hip hop was based on having doubles of a record. Early days of hip hop, they, you know, they, they, they would play them disco records. Motherfuckers be standing around like. But when the motherfucking break beats came on. I'm a little kid seeing this nigga start break dancing, everybody start dancing, you know, you hear shit like Apache, you know what I'm saying, or 
the first Please album. Me and Finesse used to always do like the Zulu events every year, the Rocksteady anniversaries and all that. So when I finally got a chance to really see them, they inspired me a little more, you know what I mean? I started learning about hip hop, you know, who was who, and who was doing what, you know what I mean? And who originated this and, and scratching, transforming. Yeah, so they inspired me. So when I went home and did my little thing, you know what I mean? I was, you know, I was a little happy about what I learned. So yeah, they inspired me, Zulu. It all go back to, to the early days of hip hop, you know. You would, you know, um, Bam and Herc, they would battle or Flash, and not only whose system, not only whose system was the clearest and the loudest, but who had the motherfucking records that nobody had. I came up in, in, in an era where dudes was taping records, was taping, put black tape or black magic marker on a beat. What? You know what I'm saying? Sorry to interrupt you, but you know what's the funny thing about that? They used to do that. But all you had to do was look at the damn crate and see the cover, and that's how you knew what it was. How did I figure out half the records? Even I have records from, you know, some cats from back then, and the records would be painted black or would have a cover on it or something. Because when you're DJing, if you got a secret what a secret record, no one knows. You know what I'm saying? That the record doesn't become special no more because everyone will have the same record. So I think the same thing happens with samples. Because it's like, you know, you want to keep the sound of what you're doing, you know, you so you keep it within your cipher, you know, information is vital. You know, if you gave everybody the same record, you know, when the song comes out, it won't be special. It was always secrecy from day one. From day one. I remember when Daisy Lady came out. Um, even that record, you know. A lot of people wouldn't come up come up off the name back then. Everybody was calling, you know, Seven Wonder. But that wasn't the name of the record. You know what I'm saying? That's just for one example. But, it, you know, to answer your question, it goes back to, you know, to the early days of, of DJing. And nigga ain't want you to know what he was cutting up. Like, I remember going to a party in 81 around the corner. And, uh, it was always this beat that I heard, right? And the drums was real crazy and real heavy on it. And I always heard it on the hip-hop tapes, but I never saw a DJ play this record. So this kid named Jacob was throwing a, a, a party in his basement on Evergreen. <laughs> and we went to the party, and uh, I heard that beat. Now, I remember this, this, the tape that I was listening to. I forgot who was rhyming on it, but the DJ played Tramp Otis Redding. He killed it. Rock it in the pocket. And he played this beat, and the beat was so crazy. And when I went to that party, when I saw that record, when I saw them pull the record out and I heard the beat, it was a purple record. Oh. And I was like, yo, this shit is so hot. It was Big Beat, Billy Squire. I, when I looked over at the DJ joint, he had the tape on it, and I was like, ah, oh, man, this record is so crazy. But like my brother just stated, dude, put it back in the cover. It was a guy on the cover with a long head, uh, a white dude in the room with two inch tape all over the place. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna remember that. And the name of the album was Billy Squire, Tale of the Tape. That's right. By the way, I just wanna brag. Take, I'm gonna take five seconds to brag. I got a two promo 12 inches of Big Beat with the stroke on the other side. Biz Marky, you ain't got that. I started DJing in like, maybe like 79, 80, you know what I mean, I was 10 years old, and um, living in the South Bronx, you know, I used to see a lot of, a lot of groups come to our area, you know what I'm saying, to set up right downstairs in the park, and I would be at the ropes, you know, trying to see what they was playing, you know, the whole thing that got me involved with hip hop was, you know, the beat thing, you know what I'm saying, I was just crazy about that shit, I would go to the jams and, they be in there playing some disco bullshit, and then at some point during the night, you knew whoever was on the turntables was going to throw on something. And that shit hit me hard. Like, I started digging, like, you could say, like, 79. I remember when I bought Paradise by Shangri-La on a 12-inch. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I had to be about in seventh grade. I mean, I started buying records at, like, uh, in 79. Um, like, when I was, like, nine years old. 
um, you know, first with like, you know, hip hop and like even like pop records, like 45s, just stuff that I just wanted to have that had like dope beats on them. And then a few years later, I started getting into actual breaks and stuff like that and like realizing like where stuff came from and stuff like that. And then I started picking up on, you know, originals, a few here and there found out about the ultimate breaks and stuff like that picked those up and then from there it was just like it was just a mission just, you know everywhere i could go find stores that had originals and stuff like that you know i always loved music from from my first album which was funky technician you know i used to sit in premiere house and show house and diamond house and we sit there for hours listening to loops you know just loops no fucking drums to them or nothing you just play a loop and I go, well, fuck that, that's, I need that. I started out DJing in the South, in the South Bronx, say about 91, 80, 90, 91, something like that. You know, I really got my start out, and that's, Finesse kind of gave me my break. I met Finesse through doing, you know, mixtapes, you know, when I first went to Rock and Will, I met up with him. You know, we kind of vibed and, you know, we kicked it off. The early part of my career, I wasn't collecting. I knew a lot about some records and beats and loops, you know, but I was too busy chasing broads, you know. Doing a regular artist shit, you know, fucking and rapping, you know. And then, um, you know, 92, I'll never forget after I did um, a track off the Trespass soundtrack, and you know what I'm about. I was, like, really one of the first first full productions I did that fucked everybody up. I know I had some because when I told people, you know, I played it, and, you know, it was, oh, this shit is incredible. Who did the beat? Oh, I did the beat. You ain't do the fucking beat, you know. Then I knew I, I got something here. I feel like I can do this production shit. Then I started collecting records and about 92, 93, we was into it heavy. I mean, probably even 91, actually. The show put me in digging. You know, just just with the aspect of like, yo, when you're looking for a record, you want to be, you know, as original as possible. So, you know, you're not like anyone else. You know, whatever you want to do, you want to try to stay, you know, one step ahead of what everyone else is doing. You know, still keep the record element in because, you know, that's what hip-hop is. Started in the game professionally. OC's first album, that's like 92. I've been in hip-hop forever. I mean, since I was a little shorty. My sisters used to have little parties with DJs come through. I used to hang around the DJs all the time. I was like one of them little bad victims. I think I might have stole a couple Treacherous 3 records back in the days because I was just liking them. Um, originally born in the Bronx, BX, New York. Raised in Mount Vernon, you know what I'm saying? Westchester County. I wouldn't necessarily say I've been digging. I, I think of it more as I'm a D, you know, I've been DJing for about 18, 19 years. And so just from just DJing, um, you know, and, and programming and everything, I just, you know, shop, for, I just shop for, you know, I just shop for records and stuff like that. And that's what, you know, that's what I do. My brother started us, because what my, you know, my, we did whatever my brother did. My brother was DJing. So I seen like the, the power and the respect he had as a DJ, and I was like, damn, I want that. So I started DJing, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, that was a long time ago. That was, that was like, what was that, 79? 78, 79? 77. Oh, damn, 77. See, old age, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm forgetting already. I was buying, going B shop. We used to call them Uptowns back in the days, like in the early 80s. We used to call them Uptowns because we had to travel Uptown to go get them. You know what I'm saying, and and uh, I've been doing that, buying beats since like '81, '82. What we used to do was when Walt went to work, I would come downstairs and practice, and then before he gets home, finish and get out of here. You know, that's how I learned how to do my thing. The first record I did was for Fever, Fever Records, for Salah Patello. I was Jesus. I was back in maybe '88, '87. Um, that was the first thing, it was for a group called Level One. And from there, um, I'm hooked up with someone, See Money, Ladies Can Have Your Attention, was the name of the record we did. Um, Red Alert used to give it a lot of burn. That, that one was um, around 88, 89. That came out on, on trumpet, and it was also Salah Patello that did the distribution. Because it was a small label that went through, through um, 
to uh, FIBA Records? I'm gonna go by when I first, 95. Nah, well, before 95, way before 95. That wasn't when you stole the guy's drum machine. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was like 90. No, that's 92. classic. Okay. But, uh, yeah, it started, first beat I sold, I think, was um, Positive K in 95. So that's what I, that's my beginning date. I had uh, a lot of records, a lot of DJs in half coming from the inner city, you know, just being so accessible to the mecca, pretty much mecca of hip hop, you know, being from Brooklyn and taking a lot of trips uptown and stuff like that. Even at that time in my life, um, I used to work as a messenger in Manhattan, so I used to go to Rock and Soul a lot and Music Factory that used to be right in Times Square and buy a lot of records. and. I had different records that, hip hop records that people on Long Island didn't have access to until like maybe a year or two after the record was out. So that's how I pretty much built my allegiance with people that were on the hip hop scene. You know, at that time it was like a, a crew called Brothers of Bass, um, Spectrum City crew, who uh, Chuck D used to be a part of. Um, Different crews, house squad, you know, different crews that was just around the neighborhood. DITC is like, it's, it's like a fucking tree. And I say that because the roots was really showing diamond to me. That's like the foundation. I mean, I have a very intricate part to play and dig in because a lot of things came, you know, through me at certain parts in the era. But I think through them too, the art of digging, to me, when you say digging in a craze, nobody ain't been saying that shit before we said that shit, you know? You can't tell me an artist or, or a crew that's, yeah, we've been digging, and we've been that shit, you know, since the fucking beginning, you know? And it really starts to me with them two. I say it first started with me and Show, you know what I'm saying? We both were like, you know, we both were DJs, you know, in our projects, far as projects. He stayed across the street, you know what I mean? And we used to go to each other's house, you know, he'd be like, yo, I got this. He'd come to my house, I'd be like, yo, I got this. I used to watch them as a kid at jams, you know, Diamond DJing or Show DJing. Diamond had beats and a craftiness way of cutting. And show was just a bad motherfucker on turntables, you know? First person I met from digging was Diamond. I just hang out with my man, just Kenny Barry Black, was down with Zulu Nation. And he introduced me to Diamond one day up by up in the Bronx by 241st Street, walking down the street. I knew him from then and we was cool. Growing up as a kid, you know, we would listen to the Zulu Nation tapes, Cold Crush, Flash, you know what I'm saying? All that did was just fuel me. Cause I was like, damn. These niggas got mad records. This character here, I, I never forget, you know, it's a pathway, you know, that I used to go, go to my high school, you know. It's like a shortcut to get to the high school. And I know, pass through the pathway, you know, he window, blinds down, you know. I used to, psh, psh, yo Ness, yo Ness, yo, what you doing today? I'm going to school. You know what I'm saying? Come up here, man. Hang out, you know? Got a few chicks coming through. Got some weed. I wasn't even smoking weed back then, but you know, nigga gonna be making a tape. You, that was the key word. Are we making a tape? A word? I'm gonna get the rhyme, you know? And nigga used to just cut out of school. Motherfucking homeroom, you know? Sit up there till four, five in the afternoon, rhyming, listening to beats. You know, that's where not a lot, a, 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 a nice part of my knowledge of, of James Brown and certain breaks and cuts came from is this nigga, man. I wish to this day I had one of them old school Diamond D tapes of this nigga cutting, catch a groove and, oh my gosh, man. The shit he used to, the way he used to cut the breaks, it wasn't like he was super, super fast, but he just knew how to finesse the, the motherfucking break part, you know? As far as, you know, me doing other people, you know, I produce so many people, it's like, off the cuff, I liked um, the shit I did on Farrell Munch's first album, called The Truth. It was him, I think, Quali, and Common. 
You know, that was crazy. I remember when I brought, <laughs> when I brought the record over to Kid Capri's house, I think Kid might have had it. But a lot of times when you have records, you know, the part could be like four or five seconds. You know, you just got to just do your thing and work with it. And when I showed him where I got it from, my man went crazy. He was like, yo, the fuck? I had this shit all the time. But I mean, uh, you know, one of my tracks, The Truth, that's the one that stands out. So he definitely came with his own sound, own style, and he, he dug hard. You know, he kind of changed up the way a lot of a lot of cats was producing at that time with his sound. Him and AG dropped their first records. People was like, yo, okay. The show was the first one really was chopping up loops like that where he took like a lot of my loops that I used on a on a Return of Funky Man album and killed them shits just chopped them shits up like whether it was like if you listen to Catch and Wreck the way he chopped up the Lou Donaldson drums the way he created um Party Groove one of if not I, I think it is correct me if I'm wrong but it is one of the first records to have a loop playing throughout the whole record with a voice sampled on top being repetitiously, you know, going repetitiously throughout the whole record with Kid Capri voice. Yo, it's crazy. Our first met show, we was both like pop lockers. I know that shit sound crazy now, but, you know, when me and show first met, we was both on some real electric boogie shit real hard, <laughs> walking around with white gloves, wilding. You know, and then... From that, we found out we both were DJs. We both were into beats. You know what I'm saying? And ever since then. You never really heard of Show and AG, but when they got on, they just got on the strength because they had a dope record. Not because they came out of Rockefeller camp, or they came out of Bad Boy camp, you know, or Rough Rider camp. You know, that was just on the strength. In 91, 92, 93, DJs didn't really care who you was down with. You know, if you was dope, you was dope. If you wasn't, they didn't want to play your record. I remember Show had a spot on um, on Prospect Avenue. It was like, like an old furniture store. My man went in there and bought every fucking thing. Damn near. I know he got that Jack Bruce album out of there. And um, <laughs> a lot of memories, yo. So really the foundation of digging starts from them two. And it's like when I got a chance to do my album on Wild Pitch Records, it's like, you know, those was the first two producers, yo, just, I love these niggas, you know, these, they, and they got some shit. First time I met Finesse was, um, actually at his video shoot for Strictly for the Ladies at the Castle. It used to be this old underground spot back in the days, Kid Capri used to DJ, DJ there, whatever. I met Finesse that night, Showbiz that night, and AG that night. I used to watch Show and Mike Smooth, you know, my DJ. And I could just watch them and I and just absorb shit like a sponge and hop on the turntables like no a few minutes later and somewhat do the exact same shit and they used to bug show out. It especially bug show out because for MC, if I got on the turntables, you would never in your fucking life think I was an MC. Finesse, he's one of the few cats that yo, a nigga do everything, yo, cut, rhyme. You know what I'm saying? The nigga do graffiti, I think. <laughs> That's my little man work. Somewhere out there, it's, it's cast that say, nah, that wasn't that. It was this one. Or, nah, it wasn't that one. It, it was uh, the shorties caught up in the system soundtrack. Or, no, that wasn't that. It was the knocking niggas off, knocking niggas out, where he freaked the Scooby-Doo shit, you know? It's, it's different things that people don't like me for. Mostly if I dig, it's probably with, you know, with finesse, you know? Here and there, but you know, mostly, you know, we might we might dig alone. It's just like it's not like an everyday thing like it used to be. We had something in common because we was both from the Bronx. His name was Buck Wild, so I used to bump in the Buck every time. You know, first of the month or maybe twice in a month, I'd do a mixtape. And when I used to go in the store, I used to bump in the Buck and we kick it. And then eventually, between making making on um, mixtapes at Show House or making mixtapes at Buck Crib. You know, me and Buck became cool. Always stay one step ahead. Always. Because that's the only thing. I'm still here. I've been doing beats since, what, um, 90, 93, 94? And it's, what, almost 2003? Mm -hmm. And 
I still make records to compete with all the other records. Once you learn how to make records, you can never go wrong. Hip hop always goes in cycles. I'm a big fan of going to somebody's crib and seeing their record collection. And when I was a kid, the first thing I would be like, yo, can I look through your records and stuff like that? Buck Wow, when you go to this house, his records were so neat and it was just, the records were just put away nice and categorized. And, and I was like, yo, I was afraid to touch his stuff. But this dude, man, this dude's hustle game is so incredible. He's the reason, he started the whole get and get in people's face, I'm going to such and such session, so they're going to hear my beats type of attitude. Buck Wild is the originator of that. Well, of course people know Biggie, Black Rob, Jay-Z, Fat Joe, O.C., um, Show and A.G., Law Finesse, Diamond, um, Faith, um, Lone, Puff, uh, wow, you know, let's get me to go on, Beanie, Bleak, um, oh my God. The list, the list can go on. I can't think of everybody. We'll be yeah. here forever. But you know, I have a pretty, pretty impressive discography. You know, a lot of stuff that I've done has been solid. A lot of fruits was created on that tree, whether they they give credit to the tree or not. You know, if it wasn't no digging, it'd be no Fat Joe, which would be no pun, be no Terror Squad. You know, if it wasn't for me discovering Buck and Buck discovering LP, it'd be no LP. You know, it'd be no OC. Everything is really created at the roots, you know, and if you want to get really, really, really deep into that, if it wasn't no diamond, wasn't no show, and wasn't no me, it'd be no Big L. If it wasn't no Big L, it'd be no Cameron, be no Mace, be no McGruff, because all of them was inspired by Big L. When Big L, they called Big L Lamont, that was his name. They called him Lil Mott Mott, you know, so when Big L got on, they was influenced and inspired. The oh shit, this rap shit is for real. We had a, like a different sound from other dudes. You know what I mean? Back then when Showing Them first came out, you know they was in a jazz era, and that's when you had your P Rocks, you had Trap Called Quest, you had Lost Professor. Everybody's really in the jazz, but we stood out because our sound was real, real, real simple, but you got identified. It was real hard. But in and out, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it wasn't real complicated, you know what I mean? But it had our signature on it, you know what I mean? And I feel we paved the way for a lot of dudes, you know what I mean? So a lot of dudes, you know, just getting up on us, you know what I mean? I never heard of us when they, you know what I mean, do get a chance to hear us. Might pick it up and get expired by that. Cats is creative. You, you don't have to give us the credit, but the fucking documentation and the discography speak for themselves. We ain't get all that on all that shit by fucking mistake. You know, I ain't get on Biggie album by mistake. I ain't get on Dr. Dre album by mistake. Shit was shit was hot. Same thing. Show ain't work with KRS One and do Sound of Police by mistake. Buck ain't do Got a Story to Tell and Whoa by mistake. You know, Diamond ain't work with Busta and all the the artists he produced by mistake. Come on, man. You know, it's ignorance that, that you know, niggas just don't understand what we capable of. You know, we definitely set some trends, you know what I'm saying? I was the first first one to think about using the blues record, you know, in the hip-hop content. You know what I'm saying? Like you said, again, show with the big band thing. I know it ain't no fluke when I walk in record stores and sometimes my first album is hanging on the wall for, for $100 and better. Because if I if it wasn't like that, I'm gonna be like a regular fucking five dollar record. Why is that record a hundred dollar record? Why? You know? Mm -hmm. Why when you walk in most of these record stores, digging and tribe called quests and 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 gangstar and certain underground artists are hanging on the wall for fifty to a hundred to come on, Diamond first album, stunts, blunts and hip hop. When two hundred dollars on the fucking wall. Why? Why is my first single that sold maybe a thousand to two thousand copies, eighty to a hundred dollars? Talking about baby, you nasty. Why? It's a purple cover with black and white artwork. Fuck. It ain't the artwork.
Juju from the Beat Nuts I've known for a while. Um, but that's how I hooked up with him because he bought the record um, at, a, at a record store in the, uh, called Numbers on Junction Boulevard. And he was like, you know, he described the record cover, he was saying, he goes, that's your record? And I'm like, yeah, that's my record. I mean, I, I've, I've always invited him to, I said, yo, come over, come over to my house, I got a little studio, da 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 we can record. I guess he was like, nah, I, I've known you forever and I don't know you for doing music. So that's why I felt he kind of slept on, on, on the whole thing, so. But once he heard the record, he was like, man, you know what, I brought that record, I brought doubles of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and next thing I know, he's knocking on my basement window and... You know, that's how I got together with him and with Les and, uh, and Fashion. I picked up shit from, from Jerry, from Juju. You know what I mean? Like, just hanging around with them, you start picking up shit. And I was very fortunate where it's like they were from around my way. And I was just, you know, just getting shit, getting shit, learning, 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 and then go home. Like, they would be on tour, and I just, you know, stay at it, stay at it, stay at it, stay at it. Then I show him a tape, and he'd be like, Yo, you know what I mean? Like this guy starting to pick up shit. Juju used to give me titles sometimes and say, "Oh, I'm looking for such and such record." And we used to go to this little um, down low spot in um, out in Queens. I think it was called Bre Breakdown Records. And uh, I mean, it, it was it had to be, you know, like it was one of those spots where it's like, okay, whatever you're looking for, you know the name of it, they're gonna have it there. Because nobody knew about it. It was like almost untouched. I think maybe Large Professor knew about it. About the only person. So every time Juju say, "Oh, I'm looking for such and such record," ah, uh, you know, he'd be like, "Listen, uh, you know, I find it. You know, it's like, oh, I'm looking for 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 James Taylor." I was like, "Oh, which James Taylor? I see. You know, I've seen a few of those. Ah, the one with the pencil writing. Writing, you know, has some writing in pencil or something like that. So it's, it's a white cover. Okay. Five minutes later, I find it." So, you know, I mean, this it was an ongoing thing, so he was like, oh, listen, man, I'm not telling you about any more records that I'm looking for, because you always find it before I find it. I knew Juju, because Juju was, I went to high school with him. But, you know, we went to other things back then, you know what I'm saying? We were, you know, Juju, nah, actually, Juju was always, damn, son, Juju was always a DJ. He used to run with this kid named Born, and Born and, D and, and Juju used to DJ together. And I remember my brother went and rhymed in Juju's crib. When Juju was just DJing and shit like that. When I first started getting with the beat notes, I told him, listen, you know, can we just, you know, I want Vic produced by Vic for the beat notes. They were like, no, nah, it has to be, say, beat nuts. Like, we're, you know, it's a whole group with the beat nuts. So it can't be, you know, like, that's, you know, you getting your credit, like, kind of separating yourself from us. So that's what kind of happened there. But, um... You know, all that earlier stuff, like the Pete Nice and whatever, whatever, you know, it's like, you know, Curious George, you know, same thing, say Beat Nuts, but it was me. Well, oh, well, actually, the Pete Nice I did with, with, with Lester, so. I wasn't really into that shit back then, and me, to be totally honest with you, neither was Juju. Juju was on some, like, other shit, you know, so was Born, and they were just doing the DJ shit, you know, on the side, but, you know, they got, they got more and more into the music. And there was one point where, you know, we were so busy doing remixes you know everybody wanted that street sound it's like okay we have this radio version we even had MC Light you know we did remixes for MC Light at the time um, Naughty by Nature uh, one of uh, Ice Cube's group um, Lynch Mob Ice T we worked with you know they just wanted okay they have their version it's more radio version it's okay now we want you know, some underground sound and stuff. DITC had it. I had a record out. We liked the record, so we were like, yo, let's, you know, let's do one. This is what we do, man. You know, like, let's, let's make a record, you know, about beat digging. So, we, you know, that's, that's how that came along. You know, so it was like, it was, I was almost like forced into the thing. I didn't want MC. And it was, you was just like, no, no, you're doing this. This is, you know, this is the one, this is one cut that you have to be on. There's no if, no buts about it. You gotta be on this one. Promise the wall, I'm an asshole! <laughs> Hello everybody, do 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 It's Mr. Walt, Beat Minus. What's up, it's DJ Evil D, you know what I'm saying? DJ for Black Moon, um, Beat Miner, uh, a lot of things I do. Engineer. 
You know what I'm saying? Protest my brother's corny beats, a lot of things. I'm the only one that got hip hop in his heart. The other one just eat hip hop. Hip hop is me. You know not, not Evil D. He's corny. Walt was in this group called Protestly Dangerous, and DEA had this record called um, The Beat Miners, which told the story about how cats would dig for beats. You know what I'm saying? That's how. I think that's how Walt got the name Beat Miners. Before Beat Miners was Beat Miners, Beat Miners' name was Black Moon. It was Black Moon Productions. You know what I'm saying? But once he took, the, once he came up with the name Beat Miners, me, Buckshot, and Five ran with the name Black Moon. And my pops, he um used to bring like a whole joint of records home when we were kids, and man, he just got me into that. You know what I'm saying? Um, Records is just me, man. You know, I'm addicted. This is I'm addicted to this. Whenever I travel, like when we go on the road, the promoter knows I have to take two, three hours time out of the day so Mr. Wall and Evil D could go record shop. Wall to dig up something, some something that's bananas. Yo, this record is hot. How you know it's hot? Cause the cover got yellow on it, <laughs> and it'll be hot. Yo, this record is hot. What do you mean it's hot? That's such and such. But did you hear this breakdown after the third riff? You know what I'm saying? Like, Walt studies. Like, Walt, he, I don't know what it is. Like, he walks around. Maybe he got, like, a crate in his pocket or something, but he studies records. We had a little joint called uh, Fence the Baby. Then, who got the props? We, we did that Very when they got, they got their deal on Nervous. Who got the props? Took us around the world and back, you know, and it established beat miners as dope producers. And then when we came with how many MCs, that finalized it. Then from there, everything was up and up. Men vs. Many, Mike Geronimo, uh, Life Check, Mike Geronimo, OC Dangerous. This always happens. <laughs> Go ahead, eat, name what you did. Uh, Tight Rod Digger, um, Trade Money, Dilay Peoples. Uh, uh, damn, I was doing better than evil. Beat Miners Football Squad, take that. Uh, Black how many MCs? Black Star, what, Star Astronomy? All your Black Moon records. Um, Think Back, Boot Camp Click. It's just a, a lot, like, a, there's a lot of records. It's like we have a competition, but it's not an angry competition. You know what I'm saying? You always want to make the better beat. So you're going to sit there, you're going to you're going to want to buy the better records to loop up. You're going to want to be the I want to be the guy the cat that can chop the MPC down or chop the SP, chop on the SP real good. You always want to be the best at what you can be. It's like a tape that has all the original samples like for instance um what we had on that first tape was like off the books, that original sample, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just the, just the break that they used, not the whole song. Because a lot of the songs that, you know, people don't know. Because we always get complaints, why don't you play the whole song? It's like, the whole song is actually not that dope. Or you wouldn't really be interested in it. It's just that one break that they used that's like, oh, okay, that's where they got it from. You know what I'm saying? So we were just doing it like that, just from break to break to break. And it's kind of like what I, when I was a kid, you know, and I used to see, you know, a lot of guys at parties and stuff like that, you know, just playing breaks. So they would be cutting up Peter, you know, they would be cutting up Bob James or whatever, you know what I'm saying? And they would just be playing that one part, even though the whole song is pretty, pretty dope. But there was a lot of breaks like that, you know, like the Thin Lizzy um, break, you know, Johnny the Fox, you know what I'm saying? Like they would just be cutting up that one part, not the whole song. And so we kind of like, well, like we should continue in that. Personally, I don't even consider mine to be mixtapes. I consider them productions, you know, because I feel like I'm producing it. I approach it the same way I would approach doing a, a, an album or a record, you know what I mean? So, you know, I just try, personally I try to just bring as much entertainment value as possible to it. That's what I like about a tape is like, you gotta really surprise me, you know what I'm saying? Like, with, with some different shit, like pull out something that you wouldn't ordinarily think that somebody would know. Even if it's a real short short sample, I think those are the ones that are like really really dope to me. If you listen to them, you can see there's a, a, a constant theme going all the way through. Uh, like one I had called Drugs, which I, I built this whole theme around um, uh, kind of like an analogy between records being drugs 
and I, you know, got all these samples from these like old drug addict records, you know what I'm saying, and threw that into the mix and, and made that all fit. It made it sound like, okay, are they talking about drugs or are they talking about records? Because it could be either one, you know. Anybody that's, that's a real collector knows what I'm talking about as far as the whole thing being very addictive. So, you know, that's, that's one of my concepts, and I try to do that on, on all of my joints, just to give it something, you know, to build on and make it stand out and be a little different. I definitely respect Soul Man's tape. I think his, his tapes are definitely dope. I, I like Supreme's tapes. Um, I would say one of the original tapes that I ever heard of doing, like, breaks was DJ Shane from the Vinyl Reanimated. He had a tape called Traveling Through, um, Traveling Through Sample Land, which was, like, a real dope tape. You know, still one of my favorites. It's mad people, you know, um, Conan the Man, my man Fusion, uh, Ken Sport. Um, yo, it's mad people. I can't even think of everybody right now. It's, it's, it's a lot of people. Poor Shadow and Cut Chemist doing that thing with the brain freezes, and, uh, you know, which is a little different from what most of us do. I think they took it kind of to a whole other level with theirs. All types of shit I don't have, but uh, I have a particular thing. Mm -hmm. Ain't nothing like money. The digging will never stop. Um, that's just a part of who we are, man. I mean, I'm a DJ. I'm always going to dig, I'm always going to look for records that I don't have, that I've been trying to get for the longest, let alone, you know, even records that I do have, I want to have 10, 20 copies of the record just because it's, it's a classic record and, you know, maybe 20 years to come if vinyl's still around, you know, it'll be a collectible. That's what I'm about to do. I was about to do that. Like school is school with cold money. This is like an original, like an original B-boy record, for real. Is that good? my year? last dollar, homie. <laughs> to be blessed to go to so many different countries and learn about other styles of music, you know, that's an inspiration on what we do creatively, to be able to go to Brazil and buy some Brazilian records and Japan and buy Japanese records, you know, Japanese music. So it's it's, it's a blessing to now be able to go around the world and explore and, and get other styles of music. I think the furthest I've been was to uh, Vienna. I went there and it took me a minute when I was there to, to, to get to find uh, the, the, the hot shit, but I found some shit when I was there, some weird off-the-wall shit. Because I think in all the countries, they try to cover a lot of American music. And then I've been to like crazy places in, in Europe. I mean, like just the regular places like, you know, Belgium. And, let me see, I haven't really done France, Germany. And then I've been out to like Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Estonia. <laughs> Been to some strange places. Guess my sign, fool. The most evilest, stingiest, <laughs> nicest, friendliest. I mean, the general thing is you go to a record store and you dig through a lot of junk, a lot of the same old records to find particular types of stuff you're looking for. And uh, we've reduced that down so that a lot of the records that you just don't want to see again, you will never see them in here. A lot of stuff does come in over the counter because we're in New York City. Uh, it's a great place to find vinyl. It's, uh, so many people over the past 30, 40, uh, you know, ever since I've been making music, New Yorkers have been buying it more than a lot of other places around the country. So there's a lot of stuff that we get that walks in that I know people around the country and around the world are very envious of. Uh, so that's, that's really a plus, plus to the store. 
but we do go into the warehouses, we do do the record shows, and we do, you know, they say pound the pavement to find this stuff. Going around the store here, we've got um, disco, R&B, some reggae, hip-hop, soul funk, jazz, soundtracks, Brazilian. It is hard to come across new things that people don't know about, uh, and that's why the, let's say the market or the co collectors are starting, starting to really get into uh, obscure stuff from really strange places of the world, and but even that's very limited. So it, it is a rare thing that I find a new record that, that really is mind-blowing that no one knows about. My name is Eric. I'm working at the A1 record store. We specialize in uh, jazz, soul, hip-hop, disco, and some break beats. All kinds of people shop here, really. Um, you know, people that buy stuff for beats and things like that, but I also sell all kinds of stuff, uh, jazz, rock, uh, weird electronic stuff. If the record is very hard to get, it's a beautiful record, you have to pay the price for that, you know. We got records from like five bucks to 400 or 500 sometimes, you know. A lot of library, I got a big collection, a few thousand of them. Um, few months back and also you know people sample anything these days uh, anything unusual so it's not just beats and anything that's uh, that other people haven't sampled yet that they can make something out of last year we, we bought a collection of library like uh, 12, bo 12, 12 boxes very good stuff and we sold it like, like that you know Buck Ride came from the ITC, they love finance too, they bought a lot showbiz a lot of people came and bought it, you know, because it's hard to get now. Over the years, uh, definitely people that come to mind are DITC, uh, Beat Nuts, um, Automator, uh, really too many to, to mention. Premiere comes through, Questlove from the Roots comes through all the time. Beat Rock, Primo, some house DJ, some of. Uh, Everybody, man. I've just created relationships with these guys, and, and you know, they trust my ears, so I'll pull stuff out and you know, just kind of turn them on to records because I get to sit here all day and listen to them and save those guys some of the time of maybe listening to records that I know, you know, it's just not up their alley. going around is really looking to find that old vinyl that they can't find anywhere else. Really to me is, I like to think a record show for cast to come together, converse, get up on some new titles, you know, put, it, put your next man on or something. Basically 80s, 90s hip hop, um, breaks, you know, um, got to give you a price, look at this right on camera real quick. MC Light, paper thin, mint condition, 15. Strictly drums, I got the hardest drums, you know. Everybody goes around and, you know, you might ask the deal if you got some drums, if you got some samples, but when people come to me, they know they're going to get something hot. It used to be the drum breaks, man, but now people want to hear a little bit more on the record. You know, if the record got a drum break, that's like a plus now, you know. Many people want to hear stuff that's funky, slow, fast tempo, whatever, but, you know, just something funky that's good to listen to, maybe good vocals in it, some good singing, not just mainly breaks anymore, because sometimes you might pay $70 for a record if it's only got a drum on it and you use the drum up, what else can you do with it? Basically the early 90s stuff, like, um, you know, like Lord Finesse, you know, um, say, uh, Lords of the Underground, uh, Pete Rock, you know, you know the, the good underground stuff, even a, a lot of the, um, 10 on that, Papa. Um, a lot of the obscure stuff is, like, really brings the money, though, like the little label stuff, something like, uh, for instance, I sold today a uh, record called Kevsky, and, uh, really rare record. It's sort of like um, a late 80s joint that like Red Alert will play. And uh, my man right here on the camera, he bought this joint called Blew Up the Bridge, which not too many people know about. That's a hot joint right there. So if you know joints like that, you know hip hop. You know, I've been selling beats for like the last 10 years. Sold records to 
everybody. Like you know, who? From Q-Tip, Lord Professor, the Beat Nuts, Pete Rock, all the digging in the crates, all the cats, all the DITC, you know, um, Alchemist, T-Ray. Digging in the crates, uh, Diamond D, Lord Finesse, Buck Wow, uh, Lodge Professor, back down with our uh, main source, um, Pete Rock, Salon Remy. Man, Rob Boogie up in the Bronx, we did it all. Definitely anything overseas. You know, everybody wants that overseas beat now. You know, I think uh, the U.S. market has been saturated with beats. Cats been digging so long, like myself, we basically almost got everything. So we're looking for something new, a little different sound. I got Paul C's collection, and, and that, that shit, I mean, it was a shock. I, mean, I went in a thrift store in Staten Island where I live, and uh, I went through it, and... Uh, it said Paul C on it. I was like, oh shit. I mean, it was like maybe, it was only like, believe be honest with you, the collection was only like four crates, but it was good stuff. And uh, I just, you know, it was so cheap, it was only a dollar a piece. I just, I picked up the whole collection, you know what I mean? It, it actually it actually had um, some pictures of Paul C too, with him and his wife when he got married, which which was, was really cool, man. Roosevelt, that's where it was re really, the shows really started for me there, man, because Back about 10 years ago, um, that's when people were just finding a lot of nice breaks and then the prices were really going up on it because, like I said, people, once they found out a record was hot, everybody wanted to, to get it, you know, and we used to just trade. If I had two copies of one thing, somebody had two copies of one thing and I liked his and he liked mine, we would trade up like that, you know, I, so it wasn't unusual for me to have two or three of the same copies of a record, you know, just to trade up. And that was before the really the vendors started taking over, man, and really bring bring the prices up. It was like five in the morning, Q-Tip outside beeping his horn on some "Let's Go." Go with Q-Tip, get to the spot six o'clock, start digging. Pete Rock was already is already there. Kick Capri's already there. Lord Finesse, Buck Wild, Easy LP walking in. Lars Professor's there. You know what I'm saying? It was like. Everybody who cared for this, like the Beat Nuts was there, everyone who cared for this, cared for this music was, at, was there at the conventions, when the conventions was hot. We're here thinking that, you know, boom, we're going to be there early, walk in the door, you see Diamond, hey, what's up? Diamond, what's Diamond doing here? Look, you see Showbiz and Buff Wild in the corner, hey, Mr. Walt, hey, Pete Rock, you're like, yo, what's going on? Yo, these dudes been us here. Yo, dudes used to spend the night in the hotel the, the, the night before. We all running to each dealer, you know, trying to get get the dibs, get the first dabs on shit. You know, T-Ray, oh, man. And, and, and the shit was funny because the shit would start at like 9 o'clock. We in that motherfucker like 7 in the morning. We pay like 20, 50, whatever it took to get in that motherfucker a little earlier. You know, niggas would do just to, you know, just to be the first to get shit. The know? only thing I didn't like about fucking Roosevelt is like, you go to one guy, he's old, he's holding all the fucking records for PM Dawn. All the records. It's like, hey, you weren't playing that for me. He said, yo, I'm not opening my table for nobody until Prince B from PM Dawn gets here. We're looking at this dude like, what? Yo, you got. Like representatives from Black Moon, Pete Roxell Smooth, Tribe Called Quest, uh, digging in the crates, beat miners at this table, ready to give you money for records, and you're telling us no because you're waiting for one guy to come? Like I said, Prince B, I'm not dissing you. I like you. You're a good brother, man. You know what I'm saying? And PM don't bring impact on the game, but what I'm saying is, come on, dog. Why? Yo, we all, our money is green just like yours, but I'm not hating on you. I like you. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. I just really, that left a sour taste in my mouth, and I never went back to the Roosevelt after that. They knew that, you know, Big Man was going to drop, you know, three grand without even scrutinizing the records. You know what I'm saying? We all would be crazy, but motherfuckers ain't idiots. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, if you it, if you getting it like that, and you can drop three grand, you know, on a, on a three or four grand on a stack of records that, you know, it might only be shit, it might only be like, like four or five things on there that you can really use. Once you get a record, you'll have 10, 15 people with the same record. Because as that dealer goes somewhere and he finds a record, he's finding more than one. Because mm -hmm. I know I went to the convention and traded records with some of these dealers where I gave them five or six copies of the same record 
and they sold it to these same people. They went from being for the record people to a novelty act. Like they started having DJ battles and rhyme contests and you know, you you know, you go in there to collect records, you're not going there to see DJ such and such battle and this and that. And then favoritism got in the game too. You know what I'm saying? So he wasn't trying to see all that. One person used the record. Buster Rhymes used the Seals and Croft for Put Your Hands Where My Eyes Can See. Before uh, Put Your Hands came out, there was like $3 you saw this record. When Buster did it, it's $50, $60. That was unnecessary. Come on. I mean, I understand it's a business, but come on. Make it a, another reason why you made it for $50, $60. I find dollar records, that, that is, you know, and that's the truth. Because they all, they all start at a dollar. The guy that showed you that beat and it becomes so popular, he got it for a dollar or fifty cents. He didn't pay two hundred dollars for it. He didn't pay fifty dollars. Yeah, you know, he didn't pay anything for it. He paid a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, tops. Now all of a sudden the fucking record is two hundred something dollars. No, 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 no. Fuck that. Like right now, Sound Library A one is what the conventions used to be. You know what I'm saying? Sound Library A1 Records. It's like going in there, I feel like when I used to be at the conventions, because you're in there, you're digging for records, they're playing different beats on the on the, on the, um, you know, they're playing different records in the background. So it's like, you know, you gotta get that feeling there. I'm not really going to pay, I mean, I, to me, honestly, it's like I don't, I don't pay more than 20 bucks for a record, and 20 bucks to me is like as if it's like some hard to find stuff. Right. I'll just wait till I go out of town and hit the right spot for it. Um, and that's how I used to do it, and that's how I'm gonna continue to do it. Like, you wanna charge me this fucking price for something that I'm one of the fucking guys that were responsible for you selling, you know, for you having this fucking record store? You know, I'm one of the guys for you having this fucking responsible for you having this record store. And, and you know, and, and you go charging all, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's like I refuse. I, I'd rather, you know what, I'll go out somewhere, get records for a buck or two, show you records, Spanish records that you don't know about, that you'll never know about. You'll only know about it through me. And that's it. Maybe through somebody, you know, maybe, maybe through, you know, Juju or less from the beat nuts. That dig, you know, Spanish records. You know, but you're not, you, you, you know, you're not gonna know about it, you know, through anything else, man. You're not gonna find it. That's what I know. You know, the thing I like about, uh, you know, some of the issues that come out is that they may have liner notes and things like that, and which are good because then they then they're able to give. A, a, a perspective or talk about or discuss the music. Like I said, it's one thing to play a record, um, but it's another thing to just have a, have a sense of where it comes from, you know what I mean? The people that say, you know, they don't like reissues, I think everybody's had the ultimate breaks and beats, you know, as an right. example. It's like, that's that's a part of hip-hop culture. Reissues are cool because you necessarily don't want to take your original record out of the road. You don't want to take that $100 record out of the road. So you buy the reissue, throw it in your crate. I don't want to go ruining all these records that I've been spending, you know, so much time, you know, locating a copy of. I make acetates, so I don't have to bring my originals out. I, you know, if I, if I find one of my 45s on a Keb Darge comp, I'll buy the Keb Darge comp and play that, you know? Egon, like, he's, you know, he goes the extra mile. And I th maybe with the internet and stuff, it's easier to get a hold of people than it was back when they were doing those. Very rare. Very rare that I buy a reissue. Most of everything I try to get, I try to make original. Fucks up the whole value of records. Fucks up the whole art of digging because if you spend two, three, four, five years to get these records, to get these records, and, and I mean, for somebody to get that shit in a day or two, get your whole shit that you done spent ten years to get, you know, certain pieces, Cause this shit is on bootleg now. That, that's fucked up. Like you know, there's guys that flip reissues and you know it's cool, but you know, like they they're digging, but they're digging they're digging the surface. And those are the same guys that they start out by digging the surface, then they start getting into digging deep. You know what I'm saying? Cause you buy that reissue, you got ten records on it that people used. After a while, you're gonna want to hear. You're gonna look at it and go, "Wow, Freedom Pain." 
like this one break on there. Yo, let me um buy her album and see what she got. You know, so it, you know, it's like it's, it opens the door. Sometimes it's cheating when when they do a breakbeat record and they put all the shit on there and you know, a cat will run up to me. Yeah, I got that what you used and well, you, oh, you got the so and so album. No, I got it on a breakbeat album. Oh, get the fuck out of here, then. You, you're not a real digger, then. Get the fuck out of here, you know? When you have a business, everyone is going to do things to make money. So, you know, this is just how they're doing this. But what happens is sometimes these people who are there putting their records on their albums are not clearing these samples. And when they come back, only reason that people know about these records, you know, mainly sometimes is because these dusty fingers, these breakbeats. So right then, you put these producers in jeopardy. So therefore, if you do something like that, why don't you just, you know, um, for safekeeping, why don't you just list samples that, you know, they were already on, you know, where the credits are there, instead of something, you know, that no one really knows, and, you know, a producer gets in trouble, because then it's like, once you do that, you make bad blood, and you know, never know how someone might retaliate. Those Dusty Fingers compilations, I have nothing to do with those, all right? Just want to clear that up. That's my publishing company, you know, but... The guy doing them joints, you know, my man Danny in the Bronx, you know what I'm saying? A lot of people thought, you know, yo, why you doing that, Diamond? I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. That's my publishing company name, and Dusty Fingers is the name of his entertainment company. It's two separates. And also, Danny got mad records also. Gotta give him his props. I know a lot of producers that have really been pissed off about those compilations because they blow up their spots. And, you know, they get lawyers calling them, you know, because as used by Pete Rock or as used by so-and-so. And it's like, come on, man. That shit ain't, that shit ain't cool. Underground hip-hop has become a nerdy thing. You got a lot of cats sitting in their college dorm like, yo, you know, I wrote this rhyme. Rabble and babble and babble and rabble and babble. You can see where I see my eyes. I, you know. It's like, you know, the whole thing is, what people have to understand is you're making music for the people. You're not making music for yourself. You know, it isn't about, it isn't about you. It's about communicating to the people. <laughs> and even when it comes to digging, you know, it's, it's like that. You know what I'm saying? You're digging, you're going to put this beat together for the people to hear it. You're not putting it together so you can go... Yeah, that's hot, son. It really depends on, like, you know, the level you take it to. You can make it into a nerdy type of thing if you're, like, on some, oh, no, that's not good enough, it's, you know what I'm saying? But, like, be humble about it like anything else you do in life. It's not about, like, how many records you have. It's not about whether you got the rarest collection or whatever. It's really about what you do what you do with the records, you know? It's like, I know cast that pay five or six hundred dollars for, you know, for a record, and all it does is go sit on the shelf. And if they got six, then they got, you know, a couple thousand records like that, man, that's a down payment on a house. A lot of these cats are like, ah, oh, Bob James, I don't need those records, you know, or uh, whatever, whatever. I don't need those records. I want, like, you know, um, the Jade record. Or, you know, I want this, I, I want, uh, you know, the Tony Rubio, you know, uh, library record. You know, they want all these big records that they see on eBay. And it's like, dude, shit. <laughs> But you don't know about the other records that are dope. You're missing all the good music because you're, all you're going after is what somebody's telling you about. They become status pieces, you know? It's like guys sitting around, you know, want to want to talk about how big your dick is or whatever. It's like, who really cares, man? It's like, can you go up there and play them? You know, what happens if your house burns down? You know, you got all that shit that you hope you got insurance. It's, you know, it's whatever, man. This whole thing has become more of a business now, man. It used to be, it used to be fun. Back when I was with the Beat Nuts, yeah, it used to be fucking fun to spend all your money on records. You know, now it's a whole, it's, it's a whole different game, man. You can go buy a $900.45 and go DJ, but what you gonna do when, you know, some bad little bird comes up to you and says, I wanna hear Dancing Queen, or I wanna hear I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor. You know, in other words, it's all in your head, you know, people really don't give a fuck, so that's something to think about, man, you know, when you're out there buying records and constantly getting on eBay and shopping on, you know, and, and shopping on eBay. Honestly, I don't even have a computer. Um, through my man, my man, um, my man, my partner, Book, and my man, Ken Sport, uh, if I need a record, if they, if they, if they see a record on, uh, on the net that I might want, 
they'll, they'll let me know and they'll get it for me. But nothing against the net at all. I still just I just go out right now just the old fashioned way and find what I want. I've never bought a record off of eBay, and I never will. That's just how you know. That's just that you know. That's just that's just how that's just how I am. Digging in your drawers. Ha <laughs> ha You could go record shopping in your pajamas. I like eBay. For the most part, I like it. Because uh uh, you know, point blank, I can find records there, I can sell records there if I need to just get rid of something, you know. So I love eBay. If you try and make some money and flip a record, then it's good to put it on the net. If um you're trying to just buy some records, sometimes you'll find yourself in a fucked up situation. A lot of people use eBay prices as a gauge for what they should price their records, which is ridiculous. Because you can have two nuts on eBay that'll take, you know, like uh, a Joe Cocker record or something, you know, and they'll have it up to, you know, $50, and that's, that's, that's ridiculous. You're not just sort of paying an asking price, you're kind of maybe going head to head with somebody that, that wants, it, wants a certain record as bad as you, and you're like, I've got to have that record, and you know, there's another person sat on the other side of the world. And he's like, oh, I've got to have that record too, and you don't know what you're doing, so you put in some crazy amount, thinking, oh, it's not going to go that high. A lot of them, they're talking about this record has a break, and it's like, there's no break on it, man. Yeah. What are you talking about? Break? Come on. There's no break at all. Uh, and then they catch a lot of people out there, but that, 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 that's where it comes in when you have to know what you're doing. As far as, you know, you can't just go by what you see on eBay, somebody saying, yo, this has breaks, you gotta know, you gotta do a little homework. As on brain freeze, as heard on product placement or whatever else they got going on, those records would go up and people will only look for those records, but all the other records, it would be like $5.99, but it would be a real dope record. They would pass right by them. Wouldn't even think twice about it. You know what I'm saying? And that's what a lot of people like myself used to come up on records because a lot of those cats, those new cats would just pass by them. And they still do that. It's just like they haven't learned, really learned anything yet. Beat digging itself is an art form, you know what I'm saying? It's like, and it's fun and going out and trying to find those records and, you know, and also trying to find other things that you might not know about just by picking up a, a label or a year or, you know, other affiliated artists that's on the record. It's just the fucking addiction that you got some just rare classic and to look around and see all the records that I got and maybe in like five to ten years when they stop making vinyl you know a lot of people that dig and dug over the past few years that have collections like this be a real asset to the market. The best thing is to still dig because when somebody comes out with an obscure joint even today that stands out. You know somebody comes out and chops a racket and flips it, you're like Oh, that's hot. There was a time when Catch was like, oh, sampling is dead. Sampling will never die. You know what I'm saying? Sampling will never die. And all of a sudden, when Crying 2001 came out and had samples on it, that's when everybody, yo, I'm saying, sampling's back again. Never went anywhere. Me, as far as me, I'm always going to sample. Some are going to be noticeable, some aren't. I'm always going. To, I'm always going to take my drums from records. It's infinite. I mean, you never run out of those samples. You know what I mean? I mean, as long as you dig, you dig. You know what I mean? It's always something to put your hands on. Pass by uh, uh, a garage. You know, Blaze having a garage sale. Oh, you know, get her, buy her crate. You know, whatever little crate she has. Do you have more? Oh yeah, I have more. I didn't know. You know, any uh, this was gonna sell. You know, that's what I'm into now. You know, I mean, th th that's, you know, always been part of me thinking, but it's like, i just rather go to, you know, someone's garage, someone's grandmother's house. No, I don't think that'll ever end for me. I think I'll be 70 years old. You know, like one of my uh, CDs is called Never Stop Digging. I think that's how it's going to be for me. I'm going to be like that old man on the cover still coming out and trying to find records.